Okay, good morning everyone and uh, welcome back to class. Um, before we look at uh, First Timothy uh, and study it uh, verse by verse, uh, can one of you quickly lead us in prayer, please? <clears throat> Yeah, sure. Thank you, Kiran. Father, we just come before once again your throne, Father God, Father God, give thanking you for the all semester, Father God, thanking you the subject, Father God, thanking you what we are learning, Father God, and help us to apply to your kingdom work, Father God. Give your wisdom and knowledge, Father God, that we can receive uh, your subject, that, that, that heart, Father God, that we can apply in the upcoming timing, Father God, the upcoming future, Father God. Thanking you the upcoming time just submitting to your hand father go take care of everything thank you father thank you almighty jesus name we pray amen amen thank you kiran um so anyone remembers what we uh, studied or learned um uh last wednesday now two classes just one or two points at least you can tell us what we studied about. Which books are we studying? Is the books, which books are we studying? Oh, sorry, you've uh, written it in the chat. Okay, Timothy. Okay. Are we studying Timothy? First and second Timothy. Okay. Uh, who writes uh, uh, this letter to Timothy? Who's writing this letter to Timothy? Okay, Apostle Paul. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so anyone can uh, give us a background why he's writing this letter? You can unmute your mics and speak, please. Uh, why is he writing this letter to Timothy? What is the need? Anyone remembers the background? Okay, nobody wants to answer. Okay, uh, we see that uh, during Paul's, uh, okay, thank you, Kanan, guidelines for new leadership. Okay, uh, thank you. So we see that when Paul, uh, you know, was imprisoned, his first imprisonment in Rome, he writes four letters. And one of those letters he writes to uh, the church at Ephesus. And this is a book, a letter of Ephesians. Um, and after he was imprisoned, he was, uh, uh, for two years, he was, uh, you know, released. He was free. And then he travels to Crete, um, and he leaves Titus there uh, to oversee the church at Crete. And then he and Timothy travel on to uh, Ephesus. And since there's a great need at Ephesus uh, because of the, what the, the problems the church was going through, uh, there were false teachings within the church and teachings from outside uh, that were um, kind of impacting the doctrine and the teachings and the faith of the believers. Uh, false teachers, there's a lot of confusion, uh, things that uh, had to be put in order at the church at Ephesus. And also, it, since it was a very important and strategic uh, city, and, um, uh, you know, uh, the seven churches surrounding that in Asia Minor also uh, came under uh, Timothy's um, uh, jurisdiction or under his purview. He was to oversee all of those churches. So there was a great responsibility. And um, uh, Paul knew that Timothy is the right person because, you know, uh, Timothy had been uh, traveling with Paul uh, alongside with him in the ministry for 17 years. And it's a good time of training. And uh, 
Paul sensed or felt that Timothy was the right person that he needed to leave at Ephesus uh, to oversee and to bring in uh, order and teach the right uh, doctrines to the churches uh, at Ephesus and in the surrounding uh, uh, churches as well. Okay, And then Paul uh, moves on to Macedonia and then he senses uh, a need to... Um, uh, to write to Timothy, just to encourage him uh, to reiterate a few things and to uh, uh, help him deal with uh, certain issues and concerns uh, with the church at um, uh, uh, Ephesus. Okay, uh, so we looked at chapter um, one. What is a key takeaway verse uh, in chapter one? Anyone remembers that? What's the key takeaway verse? It's verse 5 and verse 19, uh, where Paul is saying that we must live and must love out of a pure heart, a good conscience, um, and a sincere faith. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so if I do away with a good conscience and do things that my conscience says that are wrong, uh, what will ultimately happen is my faith will be shipwrecked and, uh, you know, I will destroy my own faith and my relationship with uh, God. Okay, now we'll move on to chapter 2. We uh, read chapter 2, right, last week. Uh, and we also uh, uh, said a few things that really stood out for us. Uh, we shared a few things. So we'll not be reading chapter 2 uh, entirely, but we will... I'll be reading it uh, verse by verse, and we will study each um, verse in its uh, historical, cultural context and its uh, meaning and significance for us today. Okay, so First Timothy chapter two. Can somebody read verse one, please? Uh, can read it out quickly, please, without wasting any time. Somebody can read First uh, Timothy chapter two. Okay. Verse 1. Verse 1. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Okay. Thank you. So I request you all to keep your Bibles open um, and to follow through. Uh, and when I ask you to read, if you can quickly read, it will just help and it will be a good class participation as well. Now, when we are looking at it in our Bibles, it's like chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and so on and so forth. But uh, when it was written by Paul, it was just a letter. Okay, there's no chapter and there is no verse. So everything is in continuity and in connection with what was written uh, before. So in chapter one, we see in the last few verses when Paul says, you know, and begins chapter two with, therefore I exhort you, he's ba basically connecting it to what he has uh, written, uh, you know, the last few lines. Um, it says in chapter one, we read that uh, in the last few verses that there are men who are wandering away from the truth. And he mentions few men there uh, uh, and they're wandering away from uh, the truth. They're not maintaining a good conscience and hence they are destroying their faith. Now, in continuity with that, in line with that, Paul is saying, therefore, I exhort you. That means, therefore, I encourage you. Exhort means encourage that, you know, first of all, which uh, means the indication that, uh, you know, it's important that we pray. Before you do anything uh, to correct or teach, you know, first of all, what you need to do is pray. So we see the importance of prayer here. And then Paul goes on to say, um, you know, uh, pray with supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks, uh, you know, that, that needs to be made to all men, okay? Now, these are all not different, uh, uh, these are essentially, uh, you know, uh, parts of our prayer, but, uh, you know, for... Uh, and all have to do with praying, um, and they are essentially different parts of prayer. But for our purpose of our understanding, um, you know, uh, we can look at each one. What is supplication? 
Supplication is a prayer made from a very weak position, you know, not from a strong position, but something uh, somebody is making from a very weak position. They're not in a place of strength. Uh, it's basically making a plea from a very uh, disadvantageous uh, position uh, and basically uh, praying or petition, petitioning or asking for um, mercy and protection. The, the picture here is of a beggar, okay, uh, basically begging or asking for mercy. Uh, so when we're making supplication, it's like, you know, we're just pleading to God. We're not in uh, a very strong position, a place of strength. We're in a weak position, uh, in a disadvantageous position. And hence, from that position, we are pleading God for his mercy and for his uh, protection. The second thing is prayer. Uh, Prayer is a request or a petition made for the needs, uh, wants, or things that we lack, that we need, that we require. Uh, the next is intercessions. Uh, intercession, we all know, is praying for uh, somebody else or on behalf of somebody else, and primarily is you know uh, interceding on behalf of them for their salvation, and then giving thanks. Okay. Uh, giving thanks for them. So all these are basically different aspects uh, of uh, prayer or have to do with praying. Um, and so he's saying, you know, when you pray, you know, bring forth your supplications, your prayer, your intercessions, and give thanks. And he says, you know, uh, your prayer, supplications, uh, intercessions, giving thanks should be made for all men. Now, the word men here in the Greek is anthropos, which is gender neutral. It does not mean just men, okay, but it means people. So people means men and women. Um, and we see this in some versions, we see the word uh, people, not men. But when we look at this word men in the Greek, it means anthropos, which is uh, a gender neutral, which in is inclusive of women as well, children also. Okay, so he says, you know, when you pray, pray for every um, one. Okay, and then what does he say about uh, prayer? He said, uh, you know, make this prayer and intercession is to be made uh, for all men. Okay, so how do we uh, practice uh, this praying for people is, you know, uh, 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 making our supplications, intercessions, uh, prayer, thanks uh, for all men is we do it everywhere, anytime, uh, whenever it's required, and wherever we are. So even if you're going in the bus, or so we're going in, a, uh, in the car, or we are in a restaurant, or uh, you know, um, we are just at home, uh, we see something, we hear something, we see something while we're looking on uh, 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 reading the news, the newspaper or listening to the news on TV or uh, looking at it on our mobile phones, you know, wherever, whether you're walking in the, or down the street or you're in your house, in your locality or in the mall, you're driving, anywhere when you see something quickly, you know, uh, uh, make your uh, petitions, your supplications, your thanksgiving uh, be known to um, God. Okay, let prayer arise from your heart anytime, every time, uh, uh, wherever you are, you know, according to the need that you see around us, just let your, uh, you know, um, a prayer be made to God. Take up your prayer request to God or intercede for people. So even if you are uh, driving or riding and you hear the ambulance just uh, buzzing past, you know, you don't know who's there in the ambulance, but you can just pray for that person. You see a poor beggar on the street, you can just uh, pray for them. You see somebody, uh, you know, not able to walk, an elderly person, just to, you know, pray. You're just looking at all of these things, but just keep, uh, you know, uh, sending up your prayer request to God at all times okay so he says pray for all men or pray for all people uh, let's look at verse 2 can somebody read uh, first Timothy chapter 2 verse 2 please for kings and, uh, and all others who are in authority that we may live a quiet and peaceful life a peacefully life with all reverence towards God and with proper conduct thank you so here he's instructing us to pray for all people, 
uh, and here pray even for those in civil authority, for those who are kings, for rulers, uh, for leaders. And he's saying, why should we pray for kings, rulers, uh, leaders of our land? Is so that we can lead, uh, you know, quiet and peaceful lives and live in all godliness and reverence towards um, God. Okay, so um, we are instructed to pray and uh, our prayers do matter uh, and our prayers affect uh, both of these aspects that, you know, it affects us in a way that we can live quiet and peaceful lives and also that we can live in all godliness and reverence towards God. Now, when Paul is asking the church at Ephesus uh, to pray for kings and, uh, you know, those in authority, it was not something very, very uh, easy for him to say himself and also for the church uh, to pray for uh, uh, leaders. It was not easy for the Christians at, those, at, at the Paul's time to pray for leaders because the Christians were severely persecuted and when Paul is writing this, um, uh, the, the king or the emperor, the ruler was Nero, uh, who was the emperor at Rome. Uh, and now he came into power by murdering two people. Okay, And he was known to be a very wicked and a very terrible man. Um, and in AD, 7, uh, in AD 64, uh, Nero burned down 70% of Rome. Okay, um, why did he burn it down? So that he could build a palace, a bigger palace for himself. Now, when this was not taken well by the people, he turned the blame on the Christians, and hence the Christians were severely persecuted. Um, uh, you know, uh, 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 in that place, and um, uh, Nero was also known for entertaining uh, people by throwing Christians to animals. He made an entertainment about, uh, uh, like, uh, about Christians uh, by throwing them to animals, uh, making a sport of them, um, uh, burning Christians at, as torches for his life of uh, uh, indulgence and extravagance. Okay, so he did all. All of these wicked things and um, uh, we see that Paul was also in a prison. Um, he was in prison in Caesarea Philippi and, and he appealed to Caesar and hence he was brought to Rome and he was waiting for uh, 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 you know, uh, Caesar to hear his uh, case. And we see that, you know, um, uh, Paul was released from his two years of house arrest, uh, of imprisonment. Um, when uh, Nero heard his case, he let him go free. But, uh, you know, we eventually he was uh, again in prison and he was um, uh, martyred there. Okay. So we see that uh, in spite of them having such... Um, a terrible leader, Paul, is still uh, encouraging the church at Ephesus and telling them that they need uh, to pray. So it was not something very easy that he was uh, asking them to do or easy for himself, uh, uh, you know, but he asked them to pray for leaders. So we too, you know, um, uh, we have no excuse. Uh, scripture tells us that we need to pray for our leaders, whoever they are, whatever they do, uh, you know, we are to hold them in prayer. Um, and why should we pray for them? Uh, if we want to live quiet and peaceful lives, uh, if we want to live in all godliness and reverence towards God, uh, you know, then we need to uh, uphold our leaders in uh, prayer. Okay. We'll move on to verses 3 and 4. Can somebody read verses 3 and 4, please? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you. So Paul is saying it's good and pleasing in God's sight that we pray for all people, especially for those in civil authority and leaders so that we can live quiet, peaceful lives and live in godliness and reverence towards God. And this praying is also going to lead into fulfilling God's desire. What is God's desire? That everyone be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth okay so here in verse 4 we see the desire of God's heart and what is the desire of God's heart that everyone be saved and come to the knowledge of the 
truth. So all that we do, our praying, our working, then it is directed towards fulfilling God's desire under his guidance, then we know it is pleasing towards uh, God. So this is the truth that we can learn today, that it's God's will, uh, his good pleasing will, that uh, we pray for all men, pray for our leaders, and pray for people uh, to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, verses 5 and to 7, can somebody read verses 5 to 7, please? Can somebody read verses 5 to 7? Okay, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Okay, so Paul is saying here that, um, you know, um, so there is one God and one mediator between God and man. There is only one uh, provision that was made for salvation, and that salvation is only through uh, Jesus Christ. And, um, uh, you know, Jesus Christ is the only one who gave himself as a ransom for all. Now, the Greek word for this word ransom is anti-lutheron. Okay, anti lutheron which means redemptive price, the price that is made uh, for uh, redemption or the redemption price for freedom. Uh, this price is paid for uh, uh, setting a captive, that is a slave or a prisoner, uh, free. And we know that we were all slaves uh, to sin. We are slaves and prisoners of Satan. And Jesus gave his life the only life, the one life that he had for the redemption of all mankind. He gave his life, he paid the price for the redemption of all our lives. So every person, therefore, you know, uh, can walk in freedom since the price has been made and the devil has no uh, authority over us, no holding over us, no claim over our lives, because Jesus has offered the price that the Father required for the sins of mankind or for our uh, personal sins. So now Satan has no legal claim over every individual. All of his legal claims have been has been cancelled, and um, you know uh, Satan's claim over us is considered as in valid. Why? It is because the ransom price, the price for our freedom that the Father required uh, was paid in full, was the full sufficient perfect sacrifice was made for the sins of all mankind once for all and it was only through uh, the man Jesus Christ. And then Paul goes on to say that he was appointed a preacher and an apostle. And so he's saying that we are now here uh, to pray this into effect and to announce or to preach this news to the people who will come to know this truth and embrace Jesus and be saved. What is this truth? That it's only Jesus Christ who made the redemption, uh, 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 paid the redemptive price for our uh, sins, that there is only one God and one mediator between God and man, that is Jesus Christ. So he says, pray about this, pray this into effect, and announce it, that means preach this news to the people uh, so that they will come to this uh, knowledge of this truth and they will embrace this truth and they too will be saved and they will be free from slavery of sin and slavery of uh, uh, the devil, okay? And Paul is saying that he is appointed as a preacher, as an apostle, as a teacher, okay? So uh, we all know that... Uh, Paul, you know, was an apostle 
because he uh, and as he was also a pastor he pastored various churches he planted various churches um, uh, you know uh, he teaches um, he's taught in various places he writes his letter where he's teaching people through his letters um, and we also see that he walked in the prophetic office and how do we know that because much of uh, uh, what he wrote uh, was the prophetic new testament um, scripture. So much of the prophetic New Testament scripture was written by uh, Paul. Okay, and he he also served in a pastoral capacity where he pastored many churches, apostle. He pioneered and planted many churches as well. And so we see that an individual can flow in one or more ministry offices or one or more ministry uh, gifts as. The Lord Jesus determines. And so here we see that Paul was a prophet, a pastor, a preacher, a teacher, and an apostle. He, uh, you know, he flowed in uh, more than one ministry office and more than one gift. And um, uh, this is determined uh, by the Lord Jesus himself. And so we see that people and you and I can also flow in um, uh, more than one ministry gift um, and uh, in, in more than one uh, function in more than one ministry office. And Paul says that he's a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Okay, so we know that Paul was primarily uh, a minister to the Gentiles. He was taking God's word. He was teaching uh, uh, God's word and taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Um, so we see that, you know, God can call us to specific people groups. This can be a small community, a large community. He can call us to certain ge geographical uh, locations, um, uh, to a nation as a whole, to different uh, people groups, people uh, from different races, uh, you know, and we need to be willing to go where um, God is calling us, leading us, and, um, you know, um, where he's trying to position uh, so we see that God can call us into various, uh, into more than one office in, and give us more than one gifts and also send us to different communities, different races, uh, different uh, geographical locations to preach his word, to teach, uh, to pastor or to uh, be an apostle. Okay, so we'll move on to verses 8 to 10. Can somebody read verses 8 to 10, please? I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting. In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in the modest apparel, with the properly and moderation, not with the braided hair or gold pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women, proper godliness, with good works. Let learn Thank you, in silence with all submission. Thank you. Okay, in the light of all that has been said, now Paul gets back to his main point uh, about prayer. And he's saying here that men pray everywhere. Now the word here, men, uh, as you previously, uh, in the previous verses we saw he uh, where he uses the word men, it means uh, the Greek word there is anthropos, uh, which is meaning um, people, Okay, men, women, children, people. But here when he's saying men, he's using the Greek word anna, which means specifically male gender, uh, specifically men. So he's saying that he wants men, uh, you know, uh, to pray everywhere. Okay, uh, so men are to pray everywhere and it's God's desire for them uh, to pray for everyone so all you men in the class uh, you know god's desire is that you pray for everyone pray everywhere pray anytime uh, with all kinds of supplications uh, intercessions prayer requests and make known your thanks to uh, god and then he does not just uh, you know um, uh, talk to men but he's also writing about women and he's saying that Likewise, women are also to uh, pray, uh, and he wants women to adorn themselves in modest apparel, uh, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. Now, some people have taken uh, this verse and interpreted 
saying that, you know, scripture says that women should not, um, uh, you know, dress uh, with good clothes, um, you know, should not uh, uh, braid or put, uh, you know, good hairstyle, put some nice fancy hairstyles, um, or they should not wear gold or pearls or any costly clothing. Now, what is your view on this? People are taking this verse and they have interpreted it like women should not wear costly clothing, pearls, gold. They should not braid their hair. It should be very simple attire. What is your uh, thoughts or views on this? Can we have some of your views and thoughts, please? Here, uh, Paul please. is uh, saying about... Go ahead, Thomas. Karen. Go ahead. No, you go. Okay, okay. Uh, Kiran. Uh, yeah. Go. Go ahead, Anna. <laughs> okay, Thomas, go ahead. You speak. Yes. Yeah. And actually, Paul is saying that the focus, the interest, and the devotion is supposed to be in God, not on the dress or uh, personal things. More than that, we should give the importance. That that's what uh, it means. I, according to me. Absolutely right. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, the focus should not be on what you're wearing or your clothes or your hairstyle or uh, your jewelry, but it should be more on God and godliness um, and, um, uh, you know, focus mainly on God. Yes. Yes, Kiran? Yeah. We cannot take any verse, any one single verse and apply it to like our mm, some, some thought. The, it, here is Paul is sharing to entire the passage for on that moment on that day. Yeah. Okay, we can't just take this uh, verse in isolation and kind of uh, um, uh, you know interpret it. We need to see it in its uh, historical, cultural uh, setting and in light of the rest of other scripture. Yes. Um, so Dave is saying that it was strictly for the woman in that timeline, not for women now. Okay, very gracious. Thank you. Okay, so, um, you know, um, here what, uh, like Paul said, sorry, like uh, uh, Thomas just mentioned, uh, you know, Paul is also saying, meaning that women uh, must join in prayer just like men do. Okay, so uh, how should men pray, uh, Paul says, that uh, their prayer should be coupled with surrender. Uh, when he means lifting up of hands, it means totally surrender, submitting to God. He says, when you pray, you should pray with the holy hands. That means pray in holiness, in reverence, in total submission and surrender to God. And he's saying that, you know, uh, pray without wrath or doubting, which means don't pray uh, in anger and don't pray uh, and uh, pray without quarreling. So he's telling men that when they pray, their prayer must be coupled with surrender, that is lifting up of their hands, holiness, that is holy hands, without anger and without quarreling. Uh, when he says that, you know, they should not argue or pray without doubting. So he says in the like wise women should also join in prayer just like men you know they should uh, do it in holiness in total surrender um, and do it without quarreling you know not in anger and also he's mentioning here that women should dress uh, modestly he's not saying that you should not you know, actually not wear any gold or pearls or uh, uh, costly clothing, but he's saying, you know, dress modestly, um, uh, you know, and engage in good works so that your the way you dress shows uh, godliness. It demonstrates godliness. Your good works can also demonstrate godliness. Your good works are in line with your character, the way you dress, the way you appear, um, the way you act, and all should be to demonstrate godliness. So your focus should be basically on godliness and in good works and not just in, you know, dressing uh, and not just in your outward attire and in your outward um, um, looks. And hence,
hence, when we look at this passage, we cannot say this passage means that women should not wear jewelry. Um, you know, uh, when we make statements like this, that women should not wear jewelry, should not, uh, uh, you know, come with uh, fancy hairstyles, braided hair, or uh, costly clothing. Um, we must always, when we when we try to interpret or understand scripture, or we make statements like you know, women should not wear jewelry. It we should always make it or interpret uh, uh, it in the light of other scripture or the rest of scripture. So now, does the rest of scripture strictly prohibit women from wearing gold, pearls, braiding their hair, and wearing costly clothing? Now we're looking at this not because Paul is saying that. They should not wear. He does not mean that they should not wear. He's saying, you know, focus more on godliness and not meaning to say they should not be wearing all of these things. Uh, but we are looking at it in the light of what, how people have interpreted this line saying that women should not braid their hair or wear costly clothing or um, jewelry. Um, so in the light of that, uh, let's look at other scripture passages. Does other scripture passages strictly prohibit women uh, from doing all this? The answer is yes or no. What is the answer? Come on. Does the rest of scripture prohibit people from women from wearing costly clothing, gold, I don't see any answers in the chat section. Nobody wants to say anything. I don't think so. Yes, you're right, Dave. It's uh, the uh, scripture does not, uh, you know, um, mention this. There's a, it's, it's a no. Okay, so we let's look at an example about Abraham's wife Sarah. Uh, now, in First Peter chapter three, verses one to six, uh, you know, um, Sarah is pointed as an example to follow as a godly woman who is uh, uh, in submission to her husband. Um, so we see that you know we have to follow in her uh, uh, steps. That's what uh, Peter is writing in First Peter chapter three, verses one to six. But did Sarah? wear good clothes and gold yes because uh, uh, you know when um, Eliezer uh, was sent to look for a wife for uh, Abraham's son he takes uh, gold with him clothing with him uh, he takes gold bangles and um, he also gives a nose ring and gold bangles to uh, uh, Rachel and so we see you know it's uh, when he goes to find a bride for Abraham's son, he he presents all of these things as um, as gifts. So we see that uh, people in uh, in those times, in the Old Testament times, they did wear ornaments and uh, jewelry. So when Paul is saying that women should dress modestly, he's saying it, you know, because uh, they need to be. Uh, 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 conscious of uh, uh, the men that are there, the men that are looking at them, uh, to dress in a modest way that will not kind of tempt uh, 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 men or will not kind of uh, distract men in a church service or in a, in a prayer meeting. Um, so he's asking them to dress um, modestly, okay, because men are watching them and he's asking, Paul is asking uh, the women to be considered uh, with the men and, uh, you know, what they face and what they will go through uh, when they see women uh, uh, dress very beautifully with all their fancy things, okay. Uh, any questions so far? Any doubts? Any comments? Okay, so it's clear. Okay, so we women, when we dress, you know, we can dress well, but uh, dress in a modest way so that we are not kind of distracting others during the church service or in church and being a distraction to men and, um, you know, be considerate to men. Okay, we'll move on to verses 11 to 15. Can somebody read verses 11 to 15, please? Let the woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Kannan. Okay. So here, um, you know, again, people have um, taken these verses and misinterpreted that and said that women should not preach, should not teach. They cannot be leaders in the church. Uh, they can teach in children's church. It's okay. Uh, but not, uh, you know, in, a, in, the, in the adult larger gathering of the church. They cannot be leaders, deacons, pastors, bishops, um, uh, because of what Paul said, that women should learn in silence with all submission, and he does not permit women to teach or have authority over man, but to be in silence, okay? So what do you think? What do you think? Uh, is Paul really saying that women should not preach, teach, uh, uh, they should be silent. They cannot be leaders in the church. Uh, do you agree with people who are polled uh, this kind of thought, this trend, and make this as a rule? What is your ideas? Can we have some of you sharing your thoughts, please? Yeah, ma'am. Women can teach and preach and share the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, this contents on that moment, ma'am, Paul was sharing on that that time. Okay, so Kiran is saying, yes, women can preach, teach, be leaders. But uh, uh, again, as Paul is writing here, it's to a specific context, a historical cultural setting that he's, uh, uh, he's writing to. Anyone else? How many of you think that women should not preach, teach, and be leaders? I know if you would want to say. So all of you agree that women can preach, teach, and um, no one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fine. So what is uh, Paul really trying to, uh, uh, you know, mean when he, uh, what does he mean? Yes, Thomas. No, I said uh, I, I agree women can reach and teach, but the small kind of denominations are there. But uh... yes. Yeah. Can accept because God doesn't have the partiality or God sees as a woman. Yes, you're right, because uh, we see a uh, scripture. So we, we need to uh, understand what Paul is right th firstly saying here. Okay, and we need to interpret uh, these verses in the light of Paul's own ministry practice, uh, the context in which Paul is writing this epistle to Timothy. And uh, we need to also interpret this in the light of other uh, scripture okay and as Thomas rightly said you know uh, we, we uh, there are scripture passages that attest that you know for God God is not a partial God for him there's no Jew nor Greek male nor female all are uh, one in Christ Jesus he loves everyone the same okay and we also see uh, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit being manifested through, uh, you know, some women leaders, uh, Deborah, uh, God choosing them as uh, her as a judge. Um, okay. And um, uh, as well, uh, you know, Philip, uh, uh, whose um, his daughters, have, I think seven daughters Philip had, uh, were all prophetess. Okay. So we see that, um, you know, uh, God choosing uh, women into prophetic ministry into different offices and uh, empowering them with different uh, uh, gifts uh, for um, uh, the building of his kingdom so let's look at these uh, verses in the light of paul's own ministry practice first and then we look in the context in which paul is writing this uh, uh, epistle to uh, timothy and then we look at it in the light of the rest of scripture okay so in in the light of paul's own ministry practice um, we see that he does not keep away women from being involved in ministry, but we see that uh, women were part of his team. 
uh, ministry team. Uh, he also appoints them as leaders, bishops, deacons um, in various uh, places. Now, uh, we see that uh, Paul had Priscilla and uh, Aquila and Priscilla. Now, Aquila and Priscilla were husband and wife uh, who were part of his ministry team, and he recognized them as, um, uh, as a part of his ministry team and also as his co workers. Uh, he mentions them, uh, Paul mentions Aquila and uh, Priscilla as his co-workers in Romans chapter 16 verses 3 to 4. If he if he acknowledged only men, then he could have mentioned only Aquila and not uh, 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 the woman uh, Priscilla, but he mentions Aquila and um, Priscilla uh, in, uh, in also the same chapter of Romans chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, Paul recognizes a woman called Phoebe as a leader and as a deacon. And in the same chapter, verse 7, he recognizes Junia, uh, a woman leader and a fellow prisoner, uh, and also somebody who is respected by other apostles and possibly was an apostle herself. Okay. And uh, so we see that um, women were part of the ministry team of um, Paul. He appointed them as leaders in various places. Uh, he did write about them. Uh, and uh, he also acknowledged that they were apostles or deacons or um, uh, leaders. Okay. Uh, we also see when Paul is writing in Romans chapter 12, where he's talking about the membership functional gifts, the membership gifts of uh, teaching, prophecy, leadership. Uh, he does not mention one specific gender there. He doesn't just uh, mention male, but it's distributed across all believers uh, without being gender specific. And uh, Paul here in Romans chapter 12, he mentions, you know, now the gifts are given to each one. Okay. Uh, if he had to uh, say that it's mentioned uh, he was only for men, then he would have mentioned it. But he says it's these gifts are uh, given to each one. When he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit um, in 1 Corinthians 12, there also, you know, it's uh, he's writing to the church at Corinth about the, the gifts of the Spirit. And there it's also without uh, uh, mentioning any specific uh, gender. And he says... Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, Paul is saying that he encourages that all, that is men and women, uh, prophesy and he teach and teach. So he says he encourages all to prophesy and teach, and this all can uh, is inclusive of men and women. And in verse um, 26 of that of uh, chapter of, uh, 14 of 1 Corinthians. Paul is saying, what then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. So he says, uh, you know, it's so wonderful when the, the church at Corinth, when they all came to meet men, women, each one of them had a, a word of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, wisdom, word of knowledge, or they had a prophecy, an instruction, a revelation, a tongue, you know, a hymn, uh, and somebody was wanting to interpret the tongues. So everybody were eager to do it. And so he says, very good, all of you can uh, speak, but you know, uh, it must be done in a way that there is a perfect order. Okay, not in chaos, not in confusion, everyone talking at the same time, uh, you know, take turns, but do it in order uh, and do it so that the church can be built up. Okay, we'll stop here and come back after the break and uh, continue.